Chapter 26 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 26. Excerpts from My Recollections by Massimo Taparelli di Azeglio. Massimo Taparelli di Azeglio, seventeen ninety eight through eighteen sixty six. Massimo Taparelli, Marquis di Azeglio, like his greater colleague and sometime rival in the Sardinian ministry, Cavour, wielded a graceful and forcible pen, and might have won no slight distinction in the peaceful paths of literature and art as well, had he not been before everything else, a patriot. Of ancient and noble Piedmontese stock, he was born at Turin in October 1798. In his fifteenth year, the youth accompanied his father to Rome, where the latter had been appointed ambassador, and thus early he was inspired with a passion for painting and music which never left him. In accordance with the paternal wish, he entered on a military career, but soon abandoned the service to devote himself to art. But after a residence of eight years, 1821 to 29, in the papal capital, having acquired both skill and fame as a landscape painter, D'Azeglio began to direct his thoughts to letters and politics. After the death of his father in 1830, he settled in Milan, where he formed the acquaintance of the poet and novelist Alessandro Manzoni, whose daughter he married, and under whose influence he became deeply interested in literature, especially in its relation to the political events of those stirring times. The agitation against Austrian domination was especially marked in the north of Italy, where Manzoni had made himself prominent, and so it came to pass that Massimo D'Azeglio plunged into literature with the ardent hope of stimulating the national sense of independence and unity. In 1833, not without misgivings, Ettore Fiere Masca, his first romance, in which he aimed to teach Italians how to fight for national honor. The work achieved an immediate and splendid success, and unquestionably served as a powerful aid to the awakening of Italy's ancient patriotism. It was followed in 1841 by Niccolo de Lapi, a story conceived in similar vein, with somewhat greater pretensions to literary finish. D'Exiglio now became known as one of the foremost representatives of the moderate party, and exerted the potent influence of his voice, as well as of his pen, in diffusing liberal propaganda. In 1846, he published the bold pamphlet Gli Ultimi Casi di Romagna on the events in Romagna in which he showed the danger and utter futility of ill-advised republican outbreaks and the paramount necessity of adopting thereafter a wiser and more practical policy to gain the great end desired numerous trenchant political articles issued from his pen during the next two years the year eighteen forty nine found him a member of the first sardinian parliament and in march of that year victor emmanuel called him to the presidency of the council with a portfolio of foreign affairs obliged to give way three years later before the rising genius of cavour he served his country with distinction on several important diplomatic missions after the peace of villafranca and died in his native city on the fifteenth of january eighteen sixty six in eighteen sixty seven appeared d'exiglio's autobiography e mie Ricordi, translated into English by Count Maffei, under title of My Recollections, which is undeniably the most interesting and thoroughly delightful product of his pen. He was a character, said an English critic at the time, a man of whims and oddities, of hobbies and crotchets. This character of individuality, which impressed its stamp on his whole life, is charmingly revealed in every sentence of the memoirs which he has left behind him, so that, more than any of his previous writings, their mingled 
homeliness, and wit and wisdom, justify the epithet which I once before ventured to give him when I described him as the giusti of Italian prose. As a polemic writer, De Exiglio was recognized as one of the chief forces in molding public opinion. If he had not been both patriot and statesman, this versatile genius, as before intimated, would not improbably have gained an enviable reputation in the realm of art, and although his few novels are, perhaps with justice, no longer remembered, they deeply stirred the hearts of his countrymen in their day, and to say the least are characterized by good sense, facility of execution, and a refined imaginative power. A Happy Childhood from My Recollections the distribution of our daily occupations was strictly laid down for Mathilde and me in black and white, and these rules were not to be broken with impunity. We were thus accustomed to habits of order, and never to make anybody wait for our convenience, a fault which is one of the most troublesome that can be committed, either by great people or small. I remember one day that Mathilde, having gone out with Teresa, came home when we had been at dinner some time. It was winter, and snow was falling. The two culprits sat down a little confused, and their soup was brought them in two plates, which had been kept hot. But can you guess where? On the balcony, so that the contents were not only below the freezing point, but actually had a thick covering of snow. At dinner, of course, my sister and I sat perfectly silent, waiting our turn, without right of petition or remonstrance as to the other proprieties of behavior such as neatness and not being noisy or boisterous we knew well that the slightest infraction would have entailed banishment for the rest of the day at least our great anxiety was to eclipse ourselves as much as possible and i assure you that under this system we never fancied ourselves the central points of importance round which all the rest of the world was to revolve an idea which, thanks to absurd indulgence and flattery, is often forcibly thrust, I may say, into poor little brains, which, if left to themselves, would never have lost their natural simplicity. The lessons of Galateo were not enforced at dinner only. Even at other times we were forbidden to raise our voices or interrupt the conversation of our elders, still more to quarrel with each other. If, sometimes, as we went to dinner, I rushed forward before Mathilde, my father would take me by the arm and make me come last, saying, There is no need to be uncivil because she is your sister. The old generation, and in many parts of Italy, have the habit of shouting and raising their voices as if their interlocutor were deaf, interrupting him as if he had no right to speak, and poking him in the ribs and otherwise as if he could only be convinced by sensations of bodily pain. The regulations observed in my family were therefore by no means superfluous, and would to heaven they were universally adopted as the law of the land. On other occasion my excellent mother gave me a lesson of humility, which I shall never forget any more than the place where I received it. In the open part of the Cassine, which was once used as a racehorse, to the right of the space where the carriages stand, there is a walk alongside the wood. I was walking there one day with my mother, followed by an old servant, a countryman of Pilates. Less heroic than the latter, but a very good fellow, too. I forget why, but I raised a little cane I had in my hand, and I am afraid I struck him. My mother, before all the passers-by, obliged me to kneel down and beg his pardon. I can still see poor Giacolin taking off his hat with a face of utter bewilderment, quite unable to comprehend how it was that the Chevalier Massimo Taparelli d'Exiglio came to be at his feet. An indifference to bodily pain was another of the precepts most carefully instilled by our father, and as usual the lesson was made more impressive by example whenever an opportunity presented itself. If, for instance, we complained of any slight pain or accident, our father used to say, half in fun, half in earnest, when a Piedmontese has both his arms and legs broken, and has received two sword thrusts in the body, 
he may be allowed to say, but not till then. Really, I almost think I am not quite well. The moral authority he had acquired over me was so great that in no case would I have disobeyed him, even had he ordered me to jump out of a window. I recollect that when my first tooth was drawn, I was in an agony of fright as we went to the dentist. But outwardly I was brave enough, and tried to seem as indifferent as possible. On another occasion, my childish courage and also my father's firmness were put to a more serious test. He had hired a house called the Via Bile, which stands about a half a mile from San Domenico di Fiesole, on the right winding up toward the hill. Only two years ago I visited the place and found the same family of peasants still there, and my two old playmates, Nando and Sandro, who had both become even greater fogies than myself, and we had a hearty chat together about bygone times. Whilst living at this villa, our father was accustomed to take us out for long walks, which were the subject of special regulations. We were strictly forbidden to ask, Have we far to go? What time is it? Or to say, I am thirsty, I am hungry, I am tired. But in everything else we had full liberty of speech and action. Returning from one of these excursions, we one day found ourselves below Castle di Poggio, a rugged, stony path leading towards Vencigliata. In one hand I had a nosegay of wild flowers gathered by the way, and in the other a stick, when I happened to stumble and fell awkwardly. My father sprang forward to pick me up, and seeing that one arm pained me, he examined it and found that in fact the bone was broken below the elbow. All this time my eyes were fixed upon him, and I could see his countenance change, and assume such an expression of tenderness and anxiety that he no longer appeared to be the same man. He bound up my arm as well as he could, and we then continued our way homeward. After a few moments, during which my father had resumed his usual calmness, he said to me, Listen, Mamolino, your mother is not well. If she knows you are hurt, it will make her worse. You must be brave, my boy. Tomorrow morning we will go to Florence, where all that is needful can be done for you. But this evening you must not show you are in pain. Do you understand? All this was said with his usual firmness and authority, but also with the greatest affection. I was only too glad to have so important and difficult a task entrusted to me. The whole evening I sat quietly in a corner, supporting my poor little broken arm as best I could, and my mother only thought me tired by the long walk, and had no suspicion of the truth. The next day I was taken to Florence, and my arm was set, but to complete the cure I had to be sent to the baths of Vinadio a few years afterward. Some people may, in this instance, think my father was cruel. I remember the fact as if it were but yesterday, and I am sure such an idea never for one minute entered my mind. The expression of ineffable tenderness which I had read in his eyes had so delighted me, it seemed so reasonable to avoid alarming my mother, that I looked on the hard task allotted me as a fine opportunity of displaying my courage. I did so because I had not been spoilt, and good principles had been early implanted within me. And now that I am an old man and have known the world, I bless the severity of my father, and I could wish every Italian child might have one like him, and derive more profit than I did. In thirty years' time, Italy would then be the first of nations. Moreover, it is a fact that children are much more observant than is commonly supposed, and never regard as hostile a just but affectionate severity. I have always seen them disposed to prefer persons who keep them in order to those who constantly yield to their caprices, and soldiers are just the same in this respect. The following is another example to prove that my father did not deserve to be called cruel. He thought it a bad practice to awaken children suddenly, or to let their sleep be abruptly disturbed. If we had to rise early for a journey, he would come to my bedside and softly hum a popular song two lines of which still ring in my ears. Ci vuol vedere l'aurora, la si le mali plume. 
he who the early dawn would view downy pillows must eschew and by gradually raising his voice he awoke me without the slightest start in truth with all his severity heaven knows how i loved him the priesthood from my recollections my occupations in rome were not entirely confined to the domains of poetry and imagination it must not be forgotten that i was also a diplomatist and in that capacity i had social as well as official duties to perform the holy alliance had accepted the confession and repentance of Murat, and had granted him absolution but as the new convert inspired little confidence he was closely watched in the expectation and perhaps the hope of an opportunity of crowning the work by the infliction of penance the penance intended was to deprive him of his crown and scepter and to turn him out of the pale like all the other diplomatists resident in rome we kept our court well informed of all that could be known or surmised regarding the intentions of the neapolitan government and i had the lively occupation of copying page after page of incomprehensible cipher for the newborn archives of our legation such was my life at that time and in spite of the cipher i soon found it pleasant enough dinner parties balls routs and fashionable society did not then inspire me with the holy horror which now keeps me away from them having never before experienced or enjoyed anything of the kind i was satisfied but in the midst of my pleasure our successor marquis san saturnino made his appearance and we had to prepare for our departure one consolation however remained i had just then been appointed to the high rank of cornet in the crack dragoon regiment royal piedmont i had never seen its uniform but i cherished a vague hope of being destined by fortune to wear a helmet and the prospect of realizing this splendid dream of my infancy prevented me from regretting my roman acquaintances overmuch the society of jesus had meanwhile been restored and my brother was on the eve of taking the vows he availed himself of the last days left him before that ceremony to sit for his portrait to the painter landi this is one of that artist's best works who poor man cannot boast of many and it now belongs to my nephew emmanuel the day of the ceremony at length arrived and i accompanied my brother to the convent of monte cavallo where it was to take place the jesuits at that time were all greatly rejoicing at the revival of their order and as may be inferred they were mostly old men with only a few young novices among them we entered an oratory fragrant with the flowers adorning the altar full of silver ornaments holy images and burning wax lights with half-closed windows and carefully drawn blinds for it is a certain although unexplained fact that men are more devout in the dark than in the light at night than in the daytime and with their eyes closed rather than open we were received by the general of the order father panazzoni a little old man bent double with age his eyes encircled with red half blind and i believe almost in his dotage he was shedding tears of joy and we all maintained the pious and serious aspect suited to the occasion until the time arrived for the novice to step forward when lo father panazzoni advanced with open arms toward the place where i stood mistaking me for my brother a blunder which for a moment imperiled the solemnity of the assembly had i yielded to the embrace of father panazzoni it would have been a wonderful bargain both for him and me but this was not the only invitation i then received to enter upon a sacerdotal career monsignor moroso my great uncle and godfather then secretary to the bishops and regular monks one day proposed that i should enter the ecclesiastical academy and follow the career of the prelacy under his patronage the idea seemed so absurd that i could not help laughing heartily and the subject was never revived had i accepted these overtures i might in the lapse of time have long since been a cardinal and perhaps even pope and if so i should have drawn the world after me as the shepherd entices a lamb with a lump of salt 
It was very wrong in me to refuse. Doubtless the habit of expressing my opinions to everyone, and on all occasions, would have led me into many difficulties. I must either have greatly changed, or a very few years would have seen an end of me. We left Rome at last, in the middle of winter, in an open carriage, and travelling chiefly by night, as was my father's habit. While the horses are trotting on, I will sum up the impressions of Rome and the Roman world which I was carrying away. The clearest idea present to my mind was that the priests of Rome and their religion had very little in common with my father and Don Andre, or with the religion professed by them and by the priests and the devout laity of Turin. I had not been able to detect the slightest trace of that which in the language of asceticism is called unction. I know not why, but that grave and downcast aspect, enlivened only by a few occasional flashes of ponderous clerical wit, the atmosphere depressing as the plumbeous auster of Horace, in which I had been brought up under the rule of my priest, all seemed unknown at Rome. There I never met with a monsignor or a priest who did not step out with a pert and jaunty air, his head erect showing off a well-made leg, and daintily attired in the garb of a clerical dandy. Their conversation turned upon every possible subject, and sometimes upon quibustam alis, to such a degree that it was evident my father was perpetually on thorns. I remember a certain prelate, whom I will not name, and whose conduct was, I believe, sufficiently free and easy, who at a dinner-party at a villa near Porta Pia related laughingly some matrimonial anecdotes, which I, at that time, did not fully understand, and I remember also my poor father's manifest distress in his strenuous endeavours to change the conversation and direct it into a different channel. The prelates and priests whom I used to meet in less orthodox companies than those frequented by my father, seemed to me still more free and easy. Either in the present or in the past, in theory or in practice, with more or less or even no concealment, they all alike were sailing or had sailed on the sweet fleuve du Tendre. For instance, I met an old canon, bound to a venerable dame by a tie of many years' standing. I also met a young prelate, with a pink and white complexion and eyes expressive of anything but holiness. He was a desperate votary of the fair sex, and swaggered about paying his homage right and left. Will it be believed this gay apostle actually told me, without circumlocution, that in the monastery of Tor Dispeci there dwelt a young lady who was in love with me, who of course desired no better, took the hint instantly, and had her pointed out to me, then began an interchange of silly messages, of languishing looks, and a hundred absurdities of the same kind, all cut short by the pair of post-horses which carried us out of the Porta del Popolo. The opinions of my father respecting the clergy and the court of Rome were certainly narrow and prejudiced, but with his good sense it was impossible for him not to perceive what was manifest even to a blind man. During our journey he kept insinuating, without appearing, however, to attach much importance to it, that it was always advisable to speak with proper respect of a country where we had been well received, even if we had noticed a great many abuses and disorders. To a certain extent this counsel was well worthy of attention. He was doubtless much grieved at the want of decency apparent in one section of that society, or, to use a modern expression, at its absence of respectability. But he consoled himself by thinking, like Abraham the Jew in the Decameron, that no better proof can be given of the truth of the religion professed by Rome than the fact of its enduring in such hands. This reasoning, however, is not quite conclusive. For if Boccaccio had had patience to wait another forty years, he would have learnt, first from John Huss, and then from Luther and his followers, that although in certain hands things may last a while, it is only till they are worn out. What Boccaccio and the Jew would say now, if they came back, I do not venture to surmise. My First Venture 
and romance. From my recollections. While striving to acquire a good artistic position in my new residence, I had still continued to work at my Fiera Masca, which was now almost completed. Letters were at that time represented at Milan by Manzoni, Grossi, Torti, Pompeo, Letta, etc. The memories of the period of Monte, Parini, Pascolo, Porta, Pellico, Veri, Beccaria, were still fresh, and however much the living literary and scientific men might be inclined to lead a secluded life entrenched in their own houses with the shyness of people who disliked much intercourse with the world, yet by a little tact those who wished for their company could overcome their reserve. As Manzoni's son-in-law, I found myself naturally brought into contact with them. I knew them all, but Grossi and I became particularly intimate, and our close and uninterrupted friendship lasted until the day of his but too premature death. I longed to show my work to him, and especially to Manzoni, and ask their advice, but fear this time, not artistic, but literary, had again caught hold of me. Still, a resolve was necessary, and was taken at last. I disclosed my secret, imploring forbearance and advice, but no indulgence. I wanted the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I preferred the blame of a couple of trusted friends to that of the public. Both seemed to have expected something a great deal worse than what they heard, to judge by their startled but also approving countenances when my novel was read to them. Manzoni remarked with a smile, We literary men have a strange profession indeed. Anyone can take it up in a day. Here is Massimo. The whim of writing a novel seizes him, and, upon my word, he does not do badly, after all. This high approbation inspired me with leonine courage, and I set to work again in earnest, so that in 1833 the work was ready for publication. On thinking it over now, it strikes me that I was guilty of great impertinence in thus bringing out and publishing, with undaunted assurance, my little novel among all those literary bigwigs, I, who had never done or written anything before. But it was successful, and this is an answer to every objection. The day I carried my bundle of manuscript to San Pietro alla Orto, and, as Bernet expresses it, Ritrovato, un che di stampar oper lavora, disi stampami, questa alla molora, having discovered one, a publisher by trade, print me this book, bad luck to it, I said. I was in a still greater funk than on the two previous occasions, but I had to experience the worst I ever felt in the whole course of my life, and that was on the day of publication, when I went out in the morning and read my illustrious name placarded in large letters on the street walls. I felt blinded by a thousand sparks. Now, indeed, alia jacta erat, and my fleet was burnt to ashes. This great fear of the public may, with good will, be taken for modesty, but I hold that at bottom it is downright vanity. Of course I am speaking of people endowed with a sufficient dose of talent and common sense. With fools, on the contrary, vanity takes the shape of impudent self-confidence. Hence all the daily published amount of nonsense which would convey a strange idea of us to Europe, if it were not our good fortune, that Italian is not much understood abroad. As regards our internal affairs, the two excesses are almost equally noxious. In Parliament, for instance, the first, those of the timidly vain genus, might give their opinion a little oftener with general advantage, while if the others, the impudently vain, were not always brawling, discussions would be more brief and rational, and public business better and more quickly dispatched. The same reflection applies to other branches, to journalism, literature, society, etc., for vanity is the bad weed which chokes up our political field, and as it is a plant of hardy growth, blooming among us all the year round, it is just as well to be on our guard. 
Timid vanity was terribly at work within me the day Fiora Mosca was published. For the first twenty-four hours it was impossible to learn anything, for even the most zealous require at least a day to form some idea of a book. Next morning, on first going out, I encountered a friend of mine, a young fellow then, and now a man of mature age, who has never had a suspicion of the cruel blow he unconsciously dealt me. I met him in Piazza San Fidele, where I lived, and, after a few words, he said, By the by, I hear you have published a novel. Well done, and then talked away about something quite different, with the utmost heedlessness. Not a drop of blood was left in my veins, and I said to myself, Mercy on me, I am done for. Not even a word is said about my poor Fiera Mosca. It seemed incredible that he, who belonged to a very numerous family, connected with the best society of the town, should have heard nothing, if the slightest notice had been taken of it. As he was besides an excellent fellow and a friend, it seemed equally incredible that, if a word had been said and heard, he should not have repeated it to me. Therefore it was a failure, the worst of failures, that of silence. With a bitter feeling at heart, I hardly knew where I went. But this feeling soon changed, and the bitterness was superseded by quite an opposite sensation. Fiora Mosca succeeded, and succeeded so well that I felt absorbing as the French express it. Indeed, I could say, je n'aurai jamais cruet très si forte sans vente. My success went on in an increasing ratio. It passed from the papers and from the masculine half to the feminine half of society. It found its way to the studios and the stage. I became the varmicum of every prima donna and tenor, the hidden treat of schoolgirls. I penetrated between the pillow and the mattress of college boys of the military cadet, and my apotheosis reached such a height that some newspapers asserted it to be Manzoni's work. It is superfluous to add that only the ignorant could entertain such an idea. Those who were better informed would never have made such a blunder. My aim, as I said, was to take the initiative in the slow work of the regeneration of national character. I had no wish but to awaken high and noble sentiments in Italian hearts, and if all the literary men in the world had assembled to condemn me in virtue of strict rules, I should not have cared a jot. In defiance of all existing rules, I succeeded in inflaming the heart of one single individual. And I will also add, who can say that what causes durable emotion is unorthodox? It may be at variance with some rules, and in harmony with others, and those which move hearts and captivate intellects do not appear to me to be the worst. End of section 26